Um, so I'm Susan McKenzie, I'm the CEO of the Emergency Services Foundation. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're all on all over the place. Um, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging as we discuss this important but not often discussed topic of vicarious trauma. About 18 months ago, a person in emergency services communications role contacted me and asked me what we were doing about vicarious trauma. And to be honest, nothing, absolutely nothing. But the topic certainly resonated with me personally because I was also a communications person in the emergency services for some time. In fact, it was at the time when five CFA volunteers died at Linton. And although I was not on the fire ground that day, I was and I still am deeply affected by that incident. I didn't realise how affected until 20 years later, I saw one of the people from that incident and uh, I promptly burst into tears. And it struck me just how much um, that had affected me. I don't know if it was vicarious trauma, but it got me thinking about all the people who work behind the scenes um, in emergency management in different roles and how they might be affected in similar ways. So I thought we needed to start a conversation. So today we've got the privilege of speaking to four people, Erin Smith, Heather Miller, Emma Scheel and Darren Hodge. And they're all going to bring a different insight to the topic of vicarious trauma. Now, um, you can ask questions by going to the Q&A section at the bottom, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. If you write that in there, I will um, come back to you and, and ask your questions to the panellists. So I'm going to ask Darren, Emma and, and Heather to um, stop their their um, video now so we can just see Erin and we'll start with Erin and um, so welcome Erin. Thank you Susan. Insight Conversation. So Erin is an Associate Professor um, in Disaster and Emergency Response. She's a member of the Board of Directors of the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine. She also writes a monthly column called Let's Talk Mental Health for the Australian Emergency Services magazine. She's very well known across the sector and she's particularly recognised for her, um, around the world in fact, for her research on the long-term mental health impact on 9-11 responders. And she found herself deeply affected by that work. So we've got a great opportunity to speak to Erin. And I would say to anybody today, um, as always, if what we talk about today raises issue, issues for you, please speak to somebody about that, you know, either within your organisation or external to your organisation. Um, it's important to do that. So Erin, um, Let's start off by, by saying, what is vicarious trauma? Well, Susan, you and I have spoken about this at length offline. And as you know, it's a topic that I'm incredibly passionate about and have some first-hand experience with. But as you mentioned in your introduction, um, as prevalent as it is, it really doesn't get talked about as much as primary traumatisation. And I think that's slowly starting to change. But even now, some people will go, I've, I've kind of heard about the, the wording, but I still don't really know what it is. Uh, sometimes it makes a little bit more sense to call it secondary trauma, which it's also referred to in the literature. Um, and I think that secondary traumatisation kind of infers what it is. It's when you're not there at the actual traumatic event, but you are exposed in another way, whether that's listening to somebody's experience as a counsellor, for example, which is where this whole coin, that term was originally coined back in the mid-1990s was in the psychology field because therapists and mental health professionals were realising the burden they took on by listening to all these first-hand accounts of traumatic experiences. And since that time, we've come a long way and really realised that vicarious trauma or secondary trauma is this very normal response to empathically engaging 
with people who've been traumatised. So we've realised now it's not just the psychologists, for example, but it's people working in health in general. It's those in the emergency services. It's people in the media who hear stories, who are dispatched to the front lines, who are in the conflict areas and see this sort of thing as well. And it's people like me who are researching and speaking to people who have been primarily affected. And there's only so much that you can hear without then having some kind of burden yourself. And it was really interesting before I had experienced it myself, I really wasn't that familiar with it or that aware. And I think I was still a little bit confused about it until one day my psychologist and I sat down and she, she actually talked about it as being the cost of bearing witness. And that really resonated with me because so many of us in emergency management roles are going to bear witness to trauma in some format. And I think we just nowadays realise the need to put protective uh, boundaries around ourselves to look after ourselves when we're doing the jobs that we do. Is there, what's the difference between vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue? Yeah, look, those two terms do often get confused and used interchangeably. And it's perhaps not too surprising because they often do coexist but they are actually quite different. So we can experience compassion fatigue when, or sometimes referred to as burnout, um, when we've been working in a field. And uh, one way that uh, one of um, my friends talked about it is emotional erosion. You know, it just wears you down over time, but it's quite different to vicarious traumatization which actually describes this profound shift in our worldview, very similar to that that is experienced with people who actually primarily experience trauma. And with vicarious trauma, and this was something that was really quite surprising to me, is that we experience many of the same signs and symptoms as people who were primarily exposed do. So perhaps we feel numb, perhaps we feel anxious or sad, Maybe there's a feeling of hopelessness. You know, for me, there was trouble sleeping. I had a racing heart. Um, I thought I was being diagnosed with anxiety. Um, all of these symptoms and signs can be quite similar to what you would experience if you were primarily traumatised. But the difference with vicarious trauma and something that I certainly have experienced is that along with all of those symptoms, perhaps comes this feeling of guilt and almost shame because for me, in my instance, my vicarious traumatisation came about through the work I did with 9-11 responders. And I thought, goodness me, how on earth can I possibly stand up and say I've been traumatised by an event that I wasn't even at? But because I've listened to hundreds of hours of stories, I can tell you what it smelled like and I can tell you what it sounded like and what it looked like because I've heard so many stories and I would then end up having nightmares and it was me buried under the rubble based on what I had heard so those feelings of guilt and shame of putting your hand up and saying I've been traumatized because people will look at you and say well you weren't there don't be ridiculous you know it's fine up. so there's a whole host of stuff going around around the edges which makes it incredibly complex somewhat difficult to diagnose because a lot of people just simply won't come forward because we know that mental health is a tricky topic, even you know, for those who've been primarily traumatised. So those of us who are vicariously traumatised often sit back and go, oh, I don't have anything to complain about. So, yeah, the stigma associated with that um, is, is probably a, a completely different sort of stigma, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And for me, the way that I actually realised that I was even vicariously traumatised is as a researcher, I quite often go to big national and international conferences and present on my findings. And it was a presentation that I could do by rote. You know, I'd done it that many times that I knew it. I didn't need to have any notes. And at the end of these presentations, I always had a slide, which had a photo of my dear friend, Marion, who lost her firefighter husband, Dave, in the South Tower on 9-11. And it's always my prompt to thank the first responders who've been involved in my research and particularly to thank Marion because she was originally the very first person that shared her story and that prompted me to then tell others. And I got to that slide and I'd done that thank you probably dozens of times and I stopped and got choked up and started crying in front of a room of hundreds of people. 
And I was mortified and I sort of stuttered through my last spiel and shuffled off the stage. And as luck would have it, um, the person who was speaking after me was Dr. Saab Johal, who's absolutely brilliant if anyone um, wants to go away and look at anything further on this. He was a psychologist who responded after the Christchurch earthquakes and you know we had the 10 year anniversary of that event yesterday and he actually got up and said thank you Erin for showing the emotional impact that the work we do as researchers around trauma has on us and I had never stopped to think about it before and he was the first person who ever said the words vicarious trauma to me and prompted me to go away and think about it and ultimately seek help. And when I spoke to Saab about it many years later and let him know he was the reason I actually recognised it in myself and got help, he got quite surprised that, um, that just something as simple as him saying it would then make me recognise it in myself. And I think that's just a, an example of we just don't talk about it enough. And there may well, very well be people out there listening to this today who are thinking, yeah, you know, maybe I am vicariously traumatized and it's okay to talk about that and the first thing I did was talk to my GP. I was just going to ask you what did you do about it? Yeah so I sat with that you know after that conference session um, I sat with it for a little while and when I came home uh, my symptoms probably got a little bit worse. I was having nightmares and but I just put that down to the fact that we had been recording interviews and that it was very you know salient in my mind um, but I started getting the racing heart and the sweats and anxiety. And again, I always found reasons for that. You know, I I'd had cancer and I was going through menopause. So I put it down to that as well. I kept finding reasons for why I was feeling the way I was feeling. But one day I ended up having a massive panic attack at about 3 a.m. And my poor husband thought I was actually having a heart attack. And when we raced to the hospital and realised, no, it was, it was a panic attack. It made me stop. And so the next week I went and sat down with my GP and I said, I don't think I'm coping very well with the work that I'm doing. And when I explained it, she kind of said, well, duh, of course there's going to be an impact from what you're doing. Um, if you think of yourself as a glass jar, you can only push so much into it before that explodes. So we have to find healthy ways to start pulling some of those things out of that glass jar before we get to breaking point. And so she referred me on to a psychologist and that was the start of me realising what I was experiencing and trying to chip away at that stigma because I was self-stigmatising. No one else that I told ever said anything to me or, or judged me, not that I know of, but I was self-stigmatising that how dare I, how dare I even admit that I've been traumatised by something that I wasn't part of. Wow. So, you know, lots of people think, well, you know, you get cured of this. You've been to the psychologist, you've acknowledged yourself. The self-stigma, I assume, is diminished. So are you cured? It's an interesting question, Susan, and um, I'm part of a charity here in Victoria called the Code 9 Foundation, and we provide support to first responders who have um, mental health conditions that's, that result from their, their um, service to the community. And I've become very good friends with quite a number of, of people through Code 9 and you know most of them have PTSD and ongoing mental health issues and I was always interested to know what they thought about that question do you ever get cured of your traumatization and they would all resolutely say no you can learn to live with it you can learn to manage it but once you have that traumatization it will always lie within you somewhere and if you don't keep on top of your self-care and the recognition and when you do recognise signs and symptoms putting into place the plan that works for you, then you will continue to have flare-ups. And those flare-ups might diminish over time and they certainly have for me. But I know, for example, around anniversaries, that's what triggers me. And last year it was a particularly difficult anniversary because one of my dear friends who was part of my research suicided the day before. So that's made that anniversary even more difficult to approach. So this year, it's the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, which A, makes me feel incredibly old, <laughs> that it's been 20 years because I can still remember exactly where I was when it happened. 
but B, I know that I will approach that anniversary with rising anxiety levels and my heart rate will go and I'll get the sweaty palms and I'll feel nauseous. And I know that it's coming and I'll do the best that I can to manage those symptoms. But I'm sure it's the same for others around there. There'll be triggers. It might not be an anniversary. It might be a smell or a sign or a location. Um, and I'm sure Darren, who's been out in the field, can talk to that as well, that there'll be certain things that trigger memories and it all can come flooding back. So I think it's not so much about aiming to be cured of the traumatisation, but learning to live with it in a healthy way. So what has all this taught you about the work we do in emergency services? Well, I guess if I put my academic hat on, one thing that's changed massively for me is that I'm so aware of it now that I am very protective of my students that come along, for example, or my colleagues, those that are out on the road. Um, I'm always talking about vicarious trauma whenever I can to increase the recognition of it and talk about how we can potentially mitigate it and then manage it once it does occur. So I've put little things in place as a research supervisor, for example, because when I went through and started to do my PhD back in 2005, no one warned me about this. You know what? No one spoke about the mental health on researchers. And I'm sure it's the same with many people out there in the media, for example, and other roles that are in the periphery of emergency management in volunteering. Um, those of us who did work with Triple O, so I, you know, I started my career as a Triple O call taker. So you're not physically there at the scene, but you're hearing some horrible things over the phone. And that doesn't always, you know, go, you, know you don't manage that well. So I think for me, I've just become much more aware of it. And wherever I can, I'm helping others to recognise it and manage it as well. Um, we've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to come back to those, if you don't mind. So I'm going, thanks, Erin. That's incredibly powerful. I mean, you can't beat lived experience, can you, really, in terms of trying to get that understanding of what it's really like. So thank you for that. We'll, I'll come back to you, and I'm, I'm going to move on to Heather now. So... Um, Heather Miller supports Ambulance Victoria staff with mental health work cover claims successfully transition back to work. She also has a strong interest in vicarious trauma, um, having done work in that area in her previous role at Beyond Blue. So um, Heather, perhaps start by telling us, what did you do at Beyond Blue that brought vicarious trauma to your attention? Hi, well, hi everyone. Um, I'm an occupational therapist by trade and when I was working with Beyond Blue, my role was as a clinical advisor. So initially I came in to support service development, um, community development projects, um, education materials. But what was apparent when I was there was that actually there was a whole group of staff who were recruited as um, project admin, project coordinators, who worked in roles within volunteering and within um, fundraising. And what was really apparent in talking to them that actually they were becoming really affected by the phone calls they were having with their community because they were there to take the calls, work out how it all worked. But actually what happened in that role is that people would ring and donate to Beyond Blue um, in memory of someone who had suicided. And actually what happened was a lot of those people did it very soon after a suicide. It was one of their parts of their um, grieving process. So they would get on the phone and provide a whole lot of information to our staff about the details leading up to it, the event, the post-event. And so these um, people who thought they had come for an admin job within Beyond Blue to support an amazing organisation were suddenly hearing in stories that many of them could not relate to, many of them who'd not heard it all before. And while we worked at Beyond Blue and they heard all the stories, it's that lived experience that really made a difference for them and it really started affecting them. So my role then became to think about, well, what can we do to support this group? They're not health um, practitioners. They don't need to be counsellors, but they need to um, work out how to protect themselves, but also to be um, caring and supportive to those ringing in. So we created um, a peer group within Beyond Blue and a whole range of policies and procedures around how we could support those staff, how we could educate them and train them around um, the impact of hearing stories, but also how it's okay to have conversations with people who are distressed and how to set some boundaries so that they felt like they could have some safe conversations. 
Um, and particularly this peer group, we met every fortnight and initially not many people turned up. They were a little bit curious as to what we were going to talk about. But people would come and they'd ask lots of questions about what that means and why people would um, suicide or other difficult events that they often would hear about. And we'd use this opportunity to share information and educate each other, but also to share experiences around how they coped, what it felt like and the impact it had on them. And obviously they brought their all their own personal experience. So that real peer group became an amazing space for people to, I guess from that perspective, pro um, provide a bit of a prevention space um, and also for them to feel safe to talk about the impact that this had. Um, kind of like Erin had talked about, you know, they hadn't been there, they hadn't lived it, yet hearing these horrendous stories had really impacted them and they felt a bit guilty taking that on um, to feel so affected and to get off the phone and cry and have to leave the building because they were so distressed by what they'd heard. So I guess from that perspective, that was a real um, eye-opener for me. I've always worked in health and so we've always had our supervision models, we've always had our clinical um, kind of networks and supports to help us. But this was really looking at a group of people who didn't kind of realise what they were getting in for. And they did a great job. Like once they um, understood the role they could play, I think they really felt empowered. And um, I think sometimes they actually felt um, uh, kind of they'd learnt a lot from the people who had called them and amazed by people's strengths. So it wasn't always about a bad experience. It was about helping to put it in perspective. That, that's a really good example because I think, you know, for a lot of people um, listening to this conversation, they'll be working in roles that they can relate to, you know, something like that where they've got people on the phones or, or whatever that they may not, have, may not have thought about. What about in your current role, you mm -hmm. know, that you're doing at AV? Um, you're obviously dealing with people that have got mental health claims. If you see a mm -hmm come to you talking about this issue? Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's such a mixed issue, isn't it, really, in terms of we've got um, people coming in um, with mental health claims around trauma and the impact of trauma on their own personal lives. So it's about looking at their individual experience and what support they need. But then we have the return to work advisors who are there, again, to coordinate their return to work. They're not all health practitioners, so they get to hear the story that the first person came along with. Um, and then they have all their managers. So I think what it really highlights for me is the real importance of the system that surrounds people in their workplace and how important it is that we kind of go from prevention to intervention in the workplace so that really people can feel the support, um, that the different types of support that they can find what they need as they go. Um, I think the work they do, particularly at AV, like in many of the emergency services, there is trauma. We can't avoid the trauma. It comes with the job. Um, but I think we can do lots around how we manage that when people come in and um, make sure they've got the right people having the right conversations, but organisationally that we set it up the right way too. So what would be the, the one thing that you'd say to organisations? What do they need to set up? Is it this peer support sort of group? What would you suggest? I I think what I what I love about AV is that we have lots of options. So I think absolutely when people are unwell, they need a clinical response. But I think as humans, we have lots of our own personal needs. So, you know, I think peer work is amazing. And if you've got some great peers, gee, it can do a, um, make a big difference. We've got pastoral care. And I think that's also really important. Another safe space, a different kind of framework, but another really safe space for people to choose. You've got the clinical options. So I think it's about making sure we don't all have a one-size-fits-all response to this situation. And so it's about helping people understand there are lots of different things out there to help you. And you kind of, again, kind of talking about what Erin said around people need to kind of find the thing that works for them. And for us, it's about setting up things that help in a prevention space, help people stay well and be well. But if they are traumatised, make sure we've got um, options for them about what's going to work for them in their kind of recovery and coping with um, these experiences. Do you think in our sector we can prevent vicarious trauma? I think we can do a lot to make sure people are prepared um, and, and in terms of their wellbeing is maintained. I absolutely think that is possible. I'm not one to believe that everything can be controlled and every can, everything can be avoided.
but I think we can put lots of things in place to ensure people have what they need when they need it. Um, I would like to think that we could lessen the load and um, lessen the impact in time by making sure people are educated and supported in the way that they need it and that systems support them to do that. Our policies and procedures give them time and space to be able to do that. Um, I'm not sure that we can control it altogether, though. It's the work we do, yeah. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to move on to Emma now. Um, and keep asking questions and I'll come back to people. Um, Emma is also at Ambulance Victoria and her team is do patient experience reviews. So basically that requires listening to triple zero calls and reviewing clinical paperwork and discussing details with family members of the most critical cases and often with very poor clinical outcomes. So um, Emma's team obviously is um, affected by, by the sorts of things we've been talking about today. And um, one of you had a question there about leadership and I'll deal with that in, in this session. Um, Emma, can you please give us, just tell us what your people do? Yeah, sure, Susan. And, and first and foremost, thank you for putting this on the radar because I think this has certainly got me thinking about vicarious trauma within our space at, at Ambulance Victoria. So I work in the quality patient experience department. My background is nursing as a profession um, and then I found myself in this corporate space where vicarious trauma absolutely does exist. So a couple of roles that uh, my team and the extended department look at is the audit of triple zero calls, um, you know, when we have an issue identified, uh, whether that's that be through an audit or a clinical review process or we have families come to us with complaints about the care that they may have received we will audit those triple zero calls which Susan you've mentioned previously and Erin as well that they're uh, incredibly sometimes difficult to listen to and what that can encompass is half a day of looking at one call and pulling that call apart second by second um, and obviously many of the calls that we, we listen to in our space is when something has gone wrong. So they're, they're very difficult calls to listen to. Another part of our department's role is open disclosure. So that's managing the processes around when something's gone wrong or we've identified an adverse event. And often that can mean contacting and reaching out to families to say, hey, perhaps we haven't done our best work. And often that might be at a time where they might have just recently lost a loved one and we may have identified that perhaps our care might have contributed to that particular outcome. So you never know what you're going to come across when you make that, that phone call to the family. And often what it means for the family is reliving the experience. They're still in the process of grieving for that particular uh, loved one. But then further to that, what we often do as part of that open disclosure process is meet with the families as well. So again, we are really there as um, often su for support, um, but also to relive the experience, which can be terribly um, traumatic, not just for, us as a team, but also for the families. So that's probably a couple of um, areas I just wanted to touch on, I think, related to this, Susan. Yeah. Tough, very tough work, very tough work. So what would you like to see organisations do to support people? Yeah, look, I think Heather touched on um, at Ambulance Victoria, um, we have a really robust peer support program um, providing all our employees, our volunteers and also family members with um, appropriate mental health support, wellbeing support, emotional and also spiritual support. But I wanted to bring up our peer dog program, which um, operates within the front line area but also um, the dogs and their carers come into the corporate space as well and it's an experience perhaps 10 minutes of your day where the doggies come in and it's really really uplifting and I found that an incredibly positive experience obviously in the COVID context um, the corporate areas are working from home at the moment um, but I think I'll, I'll touch on what Heather said I think that um, we there's various touch points in the organisation various methods and ways in which staff can go about seeking that particular support, um, which I think is a, a really good um, positive um, about AV. They are very, very aware of vicarious trauma and, and perhaps what they can do to support their staff. 
So it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, in years gone by, we talk about peer support, but it was never for the corporate staff. I mean, I think yeah. back to that example I gave before of, of the Linton um, fire when the volunteers died. The peer support was, was all there, but it was for the first responders. It was not for the people in headquarters or in any of those support roles mm. at all. But I, I think that's changing, fortunately. Yeah, I think definitely it is. Um, particularly, I've come from a health service, acute care space, um, and obviously nursing on the front line. It was it was very there was a, a a big awareness around it. But when I recall back, I'm not sure about the corporate areas at all. Um, but I think one of the challenges organisations face is that you can absolutely make these services and these supports um, available to your staff. But how do you actually get your staff to engage? in those services um, and use those services. And I think that, you know, particularly through COVID, we've seen Ambulance Victoria reach out to staff via the intranet, um, via emails and those sorts of mechanisms. So um, I think that's a really, um, you know, the point uh, of, of difference is you've got the services available, but how do you actually get the staff to engage and to use them? So one of the programs ESF is just about to launch is a program, it's a pilot called Leading for Better Mental Health, where um, we and others across the sector through our learning network identified that, you know, if we help people lead better, um, then there's going to be less mental health issues. Now, one of the um, one of the things that topics that we've got on this program is vicarious trauma. Um, so what do you think leaders need to be aware of? Yeah, I, and I certainly uh, listened to Erin and what Erin was saying about anxiety um, and, and those sorts of signs and symptoms. So I think um, if I speak from a personal uh, perspective, I think for me, it's very much about self, it's very much about reflection and looking at what's going on for my team at, at a given um, point in time. But a couple of the um, the signs and symptoms I think that um, sort of resonate for me is, um, you know, being aware of sick leave. So staff taking um, extended periods of sick leave or disengaging. Um, I've really felt, particularly over the last 12 months, on my team, we have a, a daily catch up. So we have a 10 o'clock take catch up it's not mandated but it just brings us together as a team and and I do sort of have the um my alerts up I suppose when um you know I have a team member that won't engage in those particular in those daily catch-ups um I think for me that's sort of been a little bit of a sign in the in particularly in the last 12 months where a team member might be suffering a little bit um, I think it's probably, um, you know, I think Erin spoke about having trouble sleeping, anxiety and things like that, um, working really long hours, which I think has been a, a bit of a trap also with working from home, um, but also not taking annual leave um, as well. Um, you know, some of my staff have had quite long periods where they haven't taken any leave. So I sort of try to encourage having those, um, those leave periods but also um, what I do also encourage is that whilst we try and always plan for annual leave and those sorts of things, if you need to take time out, you need to take time out. And I know that my team, um, I think particularly more recently, compassion fatigue, which we do here around, I know Erin, you mentioned compassion fatigue is a real risk for my team. Um, I'm quite proud that I have a, a really, um, we're a very um, open, um, sharing, supportive team, which I think is, um, is, is fabulous. So I like to feel and to think that my team feels safe to raise these sorts of issues and that I provide different options for them to be able to do that. So that might be our daily catch up in the morning or our one and ones. Um, I also sort of do ad hoc telephone calls as well to each of the team just to check in and just to make sure they're okay. I think that's so important. You've actually covered some of the questions I wanted to ask you. And there was a question there from somebody who said, what's a practical tip for a manager? And I think the practical yeah. tip for a manager is know your team. Yeah. And, and, and make it a safe environment for them to say, you know what, 
I'm not coping with this. Yeah, I'm not okay. Um, I'm not okay. And I think that's probably the most um, practical, practical tip. Emma, thank you very much. I'm going thank to move you. on to Darren now. Stay there and, and we will um, come back to everybody at the end. So Darren, um, Darren is an AV flight paramedic. We've got a real theme here with AV at the moment, but um, I'll, I'll um, come back to that in a minute. Uh, Darren wrote a book called The Life on the Line, and I'm sure it was a great idea at the time to do that. And we all dream of writing our book, don't we? Um, but it had unintended consequences for Darren that he really wasn't prepared for. So Darren, firstly, welcome. And um, please tell us, you know, what's the book about and why did you write it? Uh, thanks, Susan. Thanks. thanks for having us on and hello to everyone. Um, the book is really just a series of the more sort of sentinel cases over a 35-year career in ambulance, uh, 20 on the road and 15 in an ambulance helicopter. It's sort of interesting how it came about. So in 2005, I asked my long, long-suffering partner to get married. She's a nurse. Uh, we arrived in Bali and we'd only been there for a few hours when the second Bali bombing was committed. Wow. So given our skills, we thought we would like to go and see if we could help in some way. So we presented ourselves to the hospital in Denpasar. We ended up looking after a man who was critically injured and, and been pretty poorly treated by the hospital. He was there with his daughter. She had received uh, some very, very significant burns and very sadly, uh, this man's son had been killed in the blast. We stayed with them for a day uh, until they were repatriated to Singapore. And the interesting thing for me was that uh, I was very troubled by that experience. Uh, it, it bothered me greatly. And it wasn't until a few months later, I was contacted by a man whose name was Terry. And, and he asked me to write about my experience in helping him and he was going to write a, a tribute book to his son. The interesting thing about going through that process for me was that it was really, really quite cathartic, and I, and I, and it really was quite uplifting. And I, I found it a real positive. And it wasn't until a few years later I was working on a, one of our ambulance helicopters in Victoria. I went to a case. I was very troubled by the case. It was a really nasty case, and so I decided to go back and write about it with the hope that perhaps this would be a cathartic process. And to my great surprise, it was. It was, it was really a positive and I, I sort of learned quite a valuable lesson. And from that moment, I started journaling sort of my work and I didn't just write about the bad or the sad or the terrible cases. I wrote about the positive ones as well. And it wasn't long before I sort of had a manuscript and I uh, presented it to a couple of publishers and I was fortunate enough to have it published. But as you say, Suzanne, I, my chief concern when writing the book was one, I don't embarrass the profession and I don't embarrass my organisation. Uh, and two, that people liked it. And I was ill prepared for many of the things that sort of fell out from the book. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 was, I was taken aback uh, by some of the things that happened, so. so. So tell us about how you became aware of that, that, that your book actually had a profound effect on a lot of people. Well, you know, when you write a book, you have a website, you have, uh, you know, abilities, you run social media campaigns. So there's lots of avenues in which people can get in touch. And it wasn't long after the launch of the book, I had a number of people contact me and say that they were troubled by some of the content of the book. There was one case in particular where the, 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 the specifics for the ambulance service from, in terms of getting permission from them was that I had to de-identify most of the cases unless I, with the exception was that I got written permission from the people that I included. I was collaborating with a lady who'd been involved in a really terrible accident and her husband didn't want anything to do with that process. I didn't know that, of course. But uh, after the book was released, he actually wrote, uh, sorry, he read the chapter that involved his wife. And as a result of that, he had to go and get professional care because he was so traumatised. And then when I found that out, I, I, was, I was deeply upset. I, you know, I, I think first responders... Rule number one is they want to help people. They don't want to hurt people. I was upset by that. And I also had a couple of people uh, contact me throughout the social media, et cetera, and say that they were touched. Up. It's interesting when I think about it in retrospect is that all the people that made contact and said they had been affected usually had a connection. Well, not usually, exclusively, they had a connection. So if I spoke about a car accident, they either had a loved one or they were involved in a car accident. So there was that connection. So it became quite personal for them. And um, it was something that 
really troubled me. And as I said, I had probably three or four emails and uh, a contacts and, and it did leave me quite troubled for a period of time. And how did you manage that, Darren? Well, I'm fortunate I get looked after by an exceptionally good psychologist and uh, I mention it to her and, and she's, the, she's one of these people that when you find that mental health professional who, who works with you, you know, she, she understands me and uh, she helps me find uh, a perspective that I don't often see. But uh, the way that I managed it was to balance it essentially is that, you know, I was very fortunate. I have had absolutely nothing but positive feedback uh, with the exception of some of these stories we're talking about with people that suffered some vicarious trauma but everything else has been very positive and some of those positive were things that I wouldn't have expected so you know I got lots of feedback from uh, friends and relatives of paramedics saying thank you and, and one of the one of the ones that helped me balance all that out was uh, one of the fellows that I work with I'm friends with him at work we don't socialise together, but his wife wrote me this wonderful uh, letter afterwards, which I'll treasure forever. And she said basically that her husband does not talk about his work at all, nothing, not a single word. But some days he comes home and he's withdrawn, he's quiet, he's occasionally grumpy. But after reading your book, first of all, I understand what my husband does for a living. And secondly, now I understand why he's the way he is on occasion. So when I balanced it with those sort of things, um, I didn't write it to talk, I didn't, I got in the path of having a discussion about mental health or talking about my mental health journey, but that's what a lot of people took out of it and people were keen to have that. I had a lot of people contact me and talk very specifically about their mental health journey. So I guess one of the great winners for the book for me was opening a discussion around mental health for some people. And, you know, if I have a profile internally because I work on the ambulance helicopter and I can have the opportunity to speak to some of our young people and talk about um, preparing for, you know, the job and the trauma that they can face, um, they're the positives. So I balanced the, those things, which I saw as a bit of a negative, um, and then I balanced them with the positives. Do you think first responders generally have a good grasp of the concept of vicarious trauma that their colleagues and other roles might be affected by? It's interesting. I was just sitting here thinking about this as I'm going through. So I actually thought if you'd asked me, do I understand what vicarious trauma is? Two weeks ago, I would have said, yep, I've got a good grasp of it. But it's not until I listened to, to you know, uh, a podcast, uh, you know, with one of the other panellists, uh, with Erin, and when she talked about the vicarious trauma that she suffered by listening to the stories, that it became more apparent. And, you know, I'm even listening to the stories that you, you told us. I think we as first responders have a bit of a concept, I think it's poorly understood. Most of the, our concerns around vicarious trauma would be what we would share with our friendship group or our families. Um, I think the interesting thing about that is that what happens as you become a first responder is you get desensitised to the social norms. So what you think is acceptable discussion to have openly might not necessarily be acceptable and what you think I could tell people this story and that won't be upsetting to them. It can be. And, and I guess, uh, again, that, that's one of the things that became apparent with the book is that uh, I don't think you can assume what's going to be upsetting to someone. So I think that we have a little bit of a grasp on it, but I don't think that uh, we're good about it. And, and, and I think we manage it differently individually. I personally don't talk with my friendship group that are external to, to ambulance about the, the stuff that I do. Um, and it's, it's interesting that my wife probably tells them more about what's happened with my work because, you know, in case in point is last year I went to, in 35 years, probably top two worst cases I've ever been to involving a young child. And, and I, was, I was absolutely devastated by the case. And yet, as a result, I, I withdrew socially and uh, a little bit for a few events and my wife told them and, and the beauty of having great support within your friendship group is that they never knew what the story was about or the case was about but I, I knew that I had that love and support and when I ran into them at uh, one of my dear friends I ran into just at the Straight and Coles which is not an ideal place to have a teary but uh, she just simply came up and gave me a big cuddle and said I'm thinking about you if there's anything we can do but she never knew about it so that that's personally how I I try and protect my friends from the vicarious trauma by not having that discussion. I guess the problem with that, and Erin probably could 
uh, talk more to it is the problem with not discussing it openly is that you have the potential to bottle it up. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the interesting thing, I'm sitting here listening to uh, what all the people on the panel have been saying, we talk about peer support, and we're very lucky in our organisation to have a, a formal peer support program. And I've written a note that I'll give Emma Sheil an email uh, after uh, this presentation. I think one of the, the great strengths of emergency service workers is the informal peer support process and how we support each other and, and having the ability to debrief with a person uh, that's within your team or within your skill set. So certainly for me, that ability to speak to another microflight paramedic who, by the grace of God, it was me doing the job rather than him, he knows the unique pressures and, uh, that come with that role and having the ability to have those discussions. I find that uh, a really wonderful, helpful tool. And uh, I am mindful of what was said by one of the panelists earlier, um, I think by Heather, was about working out what actually works for you within that subset. So, um, you know, I think things like the informal process, peer support process work for me, um, and obviously having that, the diary or uh, running a journal helps me deal with that. But um, I think that the question about vicarious trauma, it's certainly um, listening to Erin's podcast and, and listening to what's been said today, I don't know that we, we get taught a lot of stuff about mental health with AV, but I don't think I've ever heard it mentioned in a presentation, and that's, that raises a question, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that, which is what we're here to do today. Yeah. So. Um, I'll ask Emma and Heather and Erin to put their videos back on. And we've got a couple of questions here. So the first one, Erin, what are your thoughts um, on people that take it upon themselves to persistently invite that secondary trauma on themselves? What do you think of that? Well, that certainly resonates with me. Um, one of the first questions I ever asked my psychologist was, do you think I'm a little bit dark and twisty inside? Because I just seem to be, you know, drawn to disaster and trauma and, you know, where most people will read a, a fiction novel by the pool on holidays, I tend to read memoirs of survival or uh, on my most recent holiday, I read Hodgie's book um, because I, I, there's just something about surviving and trauma that I'm drawn to and I thought, well, maybe that makes me weird. And my psych actually said, no, it makes you empathetic and that you're a carer and you're drawn to wanting to help. But it can become problematic because you have to realise there's only so much you can do. And one of the greatest pieces of advice I was given was to figure out what my goal was. What's my end goal by doing what I'm doing? And ultimately for me with 9-11, it was to share the stories so that that narrative wasn't lost and my psych looked at me and she said well haven't you done that haven't you achieved your goal and why why do you continue to do it and I said because I don't think the problem is getting worse for the 9-11 responders they're getting sicker they're dying and their stories still need to be told but he said you need to put very clear boundaries around what you're ex expecting of yourself and when you meet those and you need to tick it off and say, I've done my job and walk away, uh, he said, you can't cure everybody. You can't make everybody feel better. And that was a really important lesson for me because I was taking phone calls at 3 a.m. in the morning because I'd not only crossed the line but massively jumped over it from being a researcher and my research participant and we'd become friends. And that was hugely problematic because that really, you know, um, influenced how much vicarious trauma I had because I became friends with not only them, but their families. They allowed me into their home. I became their secret keeper and trusted with their stories that perhaps they hadn't told anybody else. And what did I do with that? I didn't have a, a safe outlet. And as Darren mentioned, it's that fine line of needing to share the burden, but doing it safely so you don't then vicariously traumatise someone else. And I pretty much did that to my husband because he'd come home from work and I'd been sitting there all day transcribing and listening to all these interviews that I'd done and I would just bleh, fall over him. And so he would then take all that on as well. And I didn't realise until one day he got quite emotional about one of the stories that I thought, oh, I need to find a better outlet for me because I can't just simply dump it all on to him. So as Darren said, he doesn't want to traumatise his friends and family. I have learnt that lesson 
as well. So it's finding what works, as, as Heather and, and Emma have both alluded to as well, what works for you, but who are the safe people that you can unload this on? Yeah. Because you do, you need to talk about it. Yeah. yeah, and please put your video back on too. Um, this next question is probably for Heather and Emma, who are sort of in corporate roles working at home. And somebody had made the comment there or question around COVID, you know, we're working remotely. How do you pick up on the cues from people? So, Emma, you talked about the fact that they may not log into your regular team meetings. Well, have, have either of you got any other ideas? Um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I think, Susan, I've had to be a little bit more proactive in my approach to the team um, and quarantine time to catch up with them. Um, I think that's probably been the way, you know, when you're in an office environment, you very much, um, you're there, everyone's there. So you can very ad hoc go over to the next person and say, hey, what do you think about this? So you've, you know, you what you don't, what you recognise when you start working from home is the opportunities that you had in an office environment to just touch base and to debrief and and those you know have that sort of additional support so I think for me it's really been more of a proactive approach and I noticed someone uh, mentioned emotional intelligence I suppose it's putting my AI hat on and really um, looking for those signs as best I can in this current environment if that makes sense. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's hard to develop emotional intelligence. I think you either have it or you don't have it. it it's a difficult thing to, to learn. Um, Heather, do you want to add to that at all? I think it relates back to your um, point earlier too about you need to know your people and you need to know your teams and that that then does you give you little kind of tips. And I think for me um, I'm kind of in an unusual position in that I sit across lots of different teams that as I've got to know people, if I'm a bit concerned, sometimes I might just go to their manager or someone else they know and just kind of check in and say, is this kind of how they usually are like I don't know them really well I've not been at AV for a really long time so sometimes it's also just kind of finding out what's different um, in someone if I can't recognize it and something strikes me then I might just confidentially go off and have a different conversation with someone and ask that maybe they might they might be the right person to check in on them rather than me um, so also I think it's about thinking about who are everyone's little support networks and perhaps having some understanding of that as well so check-ins can sometimes happen rather than always in meetings or, I mean, the catch-ups are fabulous, but also there can be some side conversations. I think, too, our team um, over time, I think when we first came home in COVID, we all kind of bunkered down and didn't really talk to each other much, um, whereas now I think we all know that this is just the world we have. And so I think as a team we're all getting much better of just calling each other much more often, not necessarily with a purpose either. Like sometimes it is just to say, g'day, and I haven't spoken to you for a week, what are you up to? So I think it's about ensuring too that there's lots of those casual interactions happening amongst the team as well as the formal meetings so that there are opportunities to hear things, see things, um, or miss people when um, they might not return your call for a while. So it is all those kind of subtle things, yeah. Thank you. This one's a comment more than a question. It's from Sue Jamison at uh, Bushfire Recovery Victoria, and she says, uh, BRV is supporting individuals and communities impacted by the 2019-20 fires. We have staff working on the front line in communities and also fund agencies who have staff delivering case management support to individuals. Recovery can feel like a slow burn in relation to risk of burnout and vicarious trauma as our staff and the entire recovery workforce live and walk alongside people through their recovery journey. So much is resonating here. Although our staff and partners are not first responders, this is certainly real and ongoing for them as it is for researchers. And I know that there's somebody who works with me who came from the Inspector General um, for Emergency Management. And she talked to me about how just, you know, reading reports and things like that was, um, was a form of vicarious trauma for her that she'd never really had to, had to think about. So, um, oh, hang on, there's a couple more questions popped up, sneaky ones at the end here. Um, oh, actually, 
there is, this is from Sarah Hewitt, who is one of my people. There's evidence that talking to a friend or partner or a professional is one of the many ways to process vicarious trauma. Art or physical pursuits can help as well. I have a trauma specialist and, and she sculpts her emotional burdens away. And we know that art therapy and things like that. And I think that really relates back to what you were saying before is that, you know, it's um, different things for different folks, isn't it? What works for one person isn't going to work for another. So you just have to find your own self-care um, very much. And then uh, Glenn Holland from Victoria Police, thank you for the session. Um, I recall chatting to my doctor when he asked about my fighting PTSD VicPol campaign and how I was going with it. He said to me, remember to look after your health. You're not to take on their problems. Listen to the story and help them with the system. But their story is not your story. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's an interest, um, um, interesting comment. Um, then there's another one here today that, that says, thank you so much for this session. I experienced the 20, uh, 2009 fires as a volunteer firefighter and community engagement project officer for Parks Victoria. I saw the trauma people across the community went through, but also saw the trauma unrecognised of staff in the agencies. I then went off to do a postgrad research into the language around fires. And this process, while dramatic, was cathartic. I made sense of the experience for others to help make sense of the circumstances through my PhD. There's a real need for fire agency staff in the conservation field to be supported post fire since there's a deeply ingrained culture of being heroes or not being part of this hero myth. I really look forward to seeing how your ESF pilot goes. We have much to learn. That whole issue of, of, of being heroes comes up over and over again when we talk about trauma. In fact, I, I did an interview with someone last week for our Leading for Better Mental Health program where we, we talked about that subject and the piece of research that ESF is doing at the moment on stigma and help seeking is also looking at that issue of, of being a hero and how if you're a hero, of course you can't say that you need help. Um, I might have to um, um, leave it there. Just Lucy said, thank you. Fabulous insights. These um, vulnerable uh, conversations are so valuable for our sector. Much to take back to our teams and look forward to sharing the recording. Um, and somebody's asked, is there anything being done in terms of awareness targeted younger volunteers? Um, it's certainly not through ESF at this point in time, um, but um, somebody else might be doing might be doing something. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. So, in bringing this to a close today, um, I mean it's well recognised, obviously, that we're in a high risk industry and that first responders are often affected by trauma. Um, but I've never really heard people talk about that until today, and I'm sure you haven't either. So like all mental health, it's not a sign of weakness. Um, it's the cost of working with people and being empathetic um, and engage with the people that you work with, whether that's somebody at BRV in the field, whether it's as a counsellor, whether it's a return to work person, whether it's somebody doing patient experience. Whether it's, whether it's somebody writing writing reports. I can't say thank you enough to the four of you for sharing your, your stories with us today. And I know this conversation had an Ambulance Victoria slant to it. That's just the way it worked out because I thought these individuals brought different perspectives that were all very valuable, but there's much that can be translated from what they said, not least of which is how leaders need to um, connect with their teams and, and understand their teams and, and offer people a range of support, recognising that everybody's different and everybody needs different things, whether it's art therapy or, or um, sculpture or, or equine therapy or peer support or what, whatever it might be. So um, I know, um, I hope this gave you new insight. It certainly sounds like it did from some of the people, some of the comments we got there. We aim to host a conversation like this next every month um, and um, 
that's all it is. It's just a conversation, talking about some of the hard things that, that other people don't talk about. Next time I hope to do it on sort of the relationship between physical activity and mental well-being because it coincides with our involvement with the police and emergency service games. I'm having trouble finding speakers at the moment. So if you know anyone who might be helpful in that space, please tell me because I'm having real difficulty. So thank you, everybody. As I said, this is recorded and I will send out a link in the next day or so um, to your email with, um, with that. So you can listen again or you can share it with your colleagues. Um, so thank you very much and um, have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye-bye.